Welcome to another episode of Film and Impact, where we connect with indie filmmakers from around the world who are using documentary to move the needle. So I'm your host, Steph Murray, and today I have the pleasure of talking with filmmaker and producer Tony Kamau. Tony Kamau is the youngest female African documentary producer to be invited as a member of the Academy for Motion Pictures, Arts and Sciences, Documentary Branch Class of 2020, and as a creative producer, director, and founder of We Are Not The Machine Limited, which I think is a totally badass name for company, which is, a, she's a, she has a Kenyan-based um, production company. She tells stories of outsiders, rebels, and change makers. And her past credits include half-hour documentaries for Al Jazeera, MTV Europe, and BBC Africa. And the Sundance Special Jury Prize winner, Softy, which she produced, uh, alongside director um, Sam Soko, premiered at Sundance in 2020 in the World Cinema Documentary Feature Competition and also took away a special jury prize for editing. Uh, she also produced I Am Samuel alongside director um, Pete Murimi, uh, and that would be her second feature as a producer. And uh, that film had its world premiere at the 2020 edition of Hot Dogs. Tony, thank you so much for joining me on Film and Impact. I know the past year has been a whirlwind for you. So I'm just totally thrilled to be speaking with you today. Yes, thank you so much for having me here. Um, always excited to just talk about film. We're a global um, film family. So just, just happy that you invited me here and looking forward to chatting. So, well, let's start by talking about Softy, one of the films that you produced in 2020. And it has received massive critical acclaim since its release. And as I said, it, released, it received a special jury prize for editing at Sundance. Uh, first of what I would like to know is, as a producer, uh, what do you look for in a project? Like, what makes you get on board? What made you say yes for Softy? Yes, um, I mean, Softy is um, Sam Soko's uh, feature debut. And Sam is an incredibly talented um, director and storyteller, and very empathetic. Um, I first met him actually when he was editing, doing a rough edit for I Am Samuel because he's good friends with Pete. Um, it's a very small film community in Kenya. They're both Kenyan directors. So that's actually how we met Soko. And then Soko started saying, oh, I've been filming this other thing for the last three, four years. Would you like to have a look as well? Because for him, it had started out as an activism manual um that he had wanted to do just to make activists in Kenya understand like this is the process you know of um you know protesting and this is how you organize people so at first I was a bit skeptical because Boniface Mwangi um the character that he wanted to feature um in the documentary was someone who had been covered over and over again but then when I saw the material that Soko had which is a lot because he had hundreds and hundreds of hours actually we when we counted, I think it was close to 600. Um, so we had hundreds and hundreds of hours um, over the years. And what I loved about it was that it showed, you know, Boniface, um, this activist who had been shown as this hero, um, heroic figure who you couldn't necessarily relate to as an ordinary mere human being, was this person who was, you know, a father, you know, a son, you know, um, a husband, um, who was struggling, you know, with managing those aspects of his life. And I just, and he also just managed to shoot that and film that with so much dignity. And Jerry, his wife, was who was someone who had never really agreed for cameras to enter their family home, had also given access. And I just thought this is absolutely incredible. And on top of that, like Soko is has such a generous spirit as a human being and as a filmmaker. And for me, outside of access, I think someone being a good person, especially in documentary, which is so hard, is, is equally as important because you're going to be working with this person very closely for a few years. So it's hard to do that with someone who's not nice. Yeah. I, I, well, I totally feel you. And for um, having actually met Soko, you know, he just has like this, warm vibrant energy um that he gives out like really not you know freely just connects with people so easily also uh very generous with himself and i think it shows also in the way that he directed his film and he told his story um both softy and i am samuel they were films that took quite some time to film i think between five and seven years like five years for i am samuel and seven years for softy 
like what were the challenges that you faced as a producer that you had to you know respond to and solve um so maybe i could just first talk about softy because my involvement in that was shorter so with softy um i actually entered the project as a producer after most of principal photography had been done um so i got involved like after he had been filming for about four and a half five years um we just got into hot dogs um which is amazing because it gave us an opportunity to pitch for post-production financing which we really needed um by the time i got involved um i mean soko had raised some money but it was a struggle you know for him to direct and produce as his first time feature so i got on board to raise um to focus on raising financing and to focus on coordinating the global team that we had because uh, by the time I joined, um, Doc Society had joined as EPs. Um, and then roughly at the same time, um, I still film, joined as our post-production partner in Canada. And and uh, yeah, so my job was uh, mostly fundraising, um, dealing with um, safety and security around fundraising, um, dealing with managing at the global team and working remotely, which was so difficult, you know, just managing expectations and different personalities. But I think we all had the, you know, the same interest in doing an amazing film um, under, you know, Soko's vision as a director. And it again helps that Soko is such an amazing person to deal with. So we were all really fond of him and his vision. So that's, I would say the biggest challenge was because we were a first time direct and producer team with that project in particular, the biggest challenge was just convincing people um, to invest in us as a team and in the vision because um, we had quite a bit of post to do. We took to, to edit because it was 600 hours of footage and we edited down to 96 hours um, and we really wanted to do something cinematic. So, I mean, our budget wasn't small. And I think for a lot of people, they were like, oh, this is your first feature. Why shouldn't you, you should, it should be a third of this. And we were like, no, but we want to do it at a certain value, uh, production value, and we want to go for A-list festivals. So I think that was the biggest um, um, challenge, to be honest. And then I think also dealing with the release, once we got into Sundance, that was also an uphill task. Uh, because it's quite overwhelming to be in an A-list um, festival, especially one that's at the beginning of the year, uh, because there's so many things to navigate, like publicists, um, you know, trying to deal with a sales co company, you know, trying to manage expectations of everyone and the team and the investors. And so that was also quite challenging to deal with. And of course, COVID. Um, I think we all went to mini depressions after COVID because we had such an amazing physical release at Sundance and we were going to be the opening night film at Hot Dogs. So we had this incredible run that had been laid out. And then when COVID happened, of course, like the rest of the world, like, you know, everything kind of went asunder and we had to really re-strategize and not lose hope and, you know, try and adjust to this um, new world <laughs> that we're still adjusting to. Um, I would say with I Am Samo, I was involved from the beginning with the director, Pete Murimi. Um, so we started filming that in 2013. Um, it was a very, very challenging film because at, in 2013, we got a grant from this organization called DocuBox, from this organization called DocuBox. And um, they um, were kind of like the pioneers of, you know, um, independent documentary um, in East Africa in terms of financing projects in terms of, um, you know, making us as African filmmakers understand that we too um, had the right um, to, you know, like direct and produce films and be at these A-list festivals because there's a lot of work they were doing as a documentary fund, you know, outside of like funding trailers and funding production, they took us to festivals, they introduced us to different mentors because there's a lot of work that actually just needed to be done, like a lot of, um, like <laughs> kind of like prepping us psychologically and, you know, making us understand that this is a world that we had the right to belong in as African filmmakers. Um, so I would say 
that was kind of like the first stumbling block, like just understanding that it's you have the right to be at IDFA uh, in Amsterdam and you have the right to pitch to people there. It's not just Western directors who have the right to pitch there. You have the right to, you know, to um, have um, editorial control and say over your story because uh, we come from a world where we were doing like commissions for broadcasters and we didn't completely have that editorial say. And I think outside of that, because it's a queer story, there were issues around safety and security. Um, we had to be very careful about how we managed footage. And I think it's still challenging because we're still struggling with thinking about like how we're going to bring back the film to Kenya uh, because of the kind of like restrictive laws um, that we have around acceptance um, and also restrictive laws that we have around censorship um in kenya so it's still it's 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 a super challenging project to deal with but it's had an amazing festival life um at hot dogs it was a bfi right now it's doing a human rights watch film festival uh yeah so it's it's amazing but it's also challenging at the same time that's reason. it's you you've had a really amazing a journey i think with these two films and I've been following you guys from since I met you in, in 2019 at IFA, and I've always been so inspired by um, your individual journeys, but also your collaboration. And I, I would like to know, you know, you spoke about the work that uh, you've done with uh, DocuBox, um, you know, how they, they help filmmakers from East Africa to, you know, get access also to networks outside to present your, your independent filmmaking in a different way. Um, I imagine part of this work is helping the outside uh, perspective or gaze to transform that. And do you feel like as, because I know you come from a TV uh, background also, like TV producing, um, television producing. So do you feel like there has, like you've had to shift the way you do things um, based on, you know, commission work that you were doing before and maybe now, putting out your own work, like the, the stories that you want to tell in a different way, but having to sort of like, you know, push against barriers from the outside and say like, these are the stories that we're telling, you know, and that's how we're telling them. Yeah, I, I yes, I mean, that's a really good question. Like I would say there's been a huge um, shift in perspective on, so, on multiple levels. Um, I would say, first of all, from, you know, like, if you work in the TV environment where commissioning happens, so usually it would be the broadcaster who has a strand um, where they have a certain type of documentary um, that they will commission. And if you produce or direct uh, a project for them, it has to fit um, within those certain editorial guidelines. So I think it, it was a major shift just understanding. It was a good thing and a bad thing at the same time because you see those guidelines are, are great because <laughs> you know they give you a framework to work within and you also are not shooting endlessly. Like you know that this has a transmission date on such and such date. You have someone who's kind of like really walking you through the process as a commissioning editor or assistant commissioning editor. So there's, you know, there's someone to hold your hand uh, a little bit more, I would say, with commissioned work. Uh, whereas when you're doing this independent work, a lot of these roles um, that were um, carried out by the commissioning editors, especially the editorial roles, you know, fall now on, I, to a, I would say to a certain degree, um, to the producer because I guess producing for independent documentary, at least how I work, it's not just about fundraising, but it's also about, you know, like helping the director with a creative vision, you know, being like, you're kind of, I, I wouldn't say you're the champion of the creative vision for the director, but it's, it's I mean, you, you have to be a sounding board. You have to be a partner um, who is, you know, um, helping the director achieve their creative vision, whether it's through um, story discussions, whether it's through hiring the right people or firing <laughs> the wrong people, uh, whether it's through finding the right collaborators, um, and also just whether it's through just giving them a reality check, like just saying, okay, we're in this edit. I know this is your darling because you shot it, but it doesn't work for the story that you want to do. <laughs> you know, those tough conversations that the commissioning editor would have done. Um, and then I think outside of that, it's it's um, 
it's of course very um one thing but you never we never had to deal with when we were working with commissioning editors and even now because we still work with um work for hire is that you never really had to think about um the release of the film and that is a lot of work <laughs> because before i mean i came from this world where i was like okay you deliver the film and you're done you know you send your invoice and you're done but now you have to start thinking about like okay which festival are we going to release this film in um outside of that like how are we going to handle the release like we really had to do a lot of work with um i am samuel and softy just in terms of understanding like how we're going to frame it or reframe um our messaging around the film what is the story <laughs> around both films because that's equally as important for press you know thinking about publicity i'm thinking about the impact life and audience engagement like this is such it's such a huge learning curve that i think we're all still <laughs> uh, experiencing because uh, right right now we're we're in the impact phase for both projects so i would say um yeah i would say those are the major challenges uh i i i would say in terms of the differences between the two worlds between navigating the two worlds yeah Just tell me a little bit about uh, the impact impact phase. Like, what does it look like for for each film? Um, I mean, I can just give broad strokes. Um, yeah. So, so for both films, I mean, we really want to do a lot of impact work in Kenya. Um, so for Soft Tea, we have an amazing impact producer, Miriam Ayo, um, who's been leading the impact campaign. Soko and I are still involved in Impact as director and producer but she's the one who's spearheading everything and a lot of our work is around um different activities um that are aimed at creating awareness for the need of support of activists in Kenya um so we're doing this um through different ways through comms you know we have a robust robust social media strategy um we're doing quizzes um we're creating resources for people to understand how they can become activists or if they're not in a position to support activist communities uh we want to have um support groups for activists so that's what a lot of our work and messaging is around and we definitely want to do community screenings in Kenya so that's something that we're working on and because we want as many people in the country to see it as possible as possible um with i am samuel a lot of our messaging is around supporting um queer kenyans and their families um we because samuel comes from a low income background um and the challenges of being queer in kenya where the laws you know where you have laws um that criminalize um homosexual intimacy um those laws are hard to implement you know if you're living in an upper class or middle class neighborhood uh but if you're living in an informal settlement where there's less privacy where there's a high risk of viol- violence just across the board you know the risks are just higher <laughs> um for someone who comes from that kind of background so our what we'd like to do is to have i'm samuel be a resource for families um um that come from similar backgrounds just thinking about like how do you deal with someone coming out like um a support tool where people can be able to share their own stories uh because for us um i guess they're high they're more barriers <laughs> um with that story in particular just because of the restrictive laws and what we just want to do is add to the narrative that um um you know your story you have a right to share your story you have a right for acceptance um you have a right to live here and this is one of the stories that we're sharing and you also have a right to share your story within a safe space um yes yeah, so i'm just giving broad strokes i mean there's more specific stuff that we're doing um with educational materials i'm just giving <laughs> broad strokes in general um this i i mentioned that the name of your company which I think is really pretty badass. And when I see a film like Softy, of course, um I'm Samuel I'm like, yes, that makes total sense. And of course it's inspiring, but I'm curious like how did you come up with a name like We Are Not the Machine? Oh wow. Um gosh, that's an interesting because I get up, every time I go to the bank, I'm asked I'm asked like what does We Are Not the Machine do? Do you guys do my <laughs> Like, do you build machines? <laughs> and I'm like, no. <laughs> I 
I, I was like, actually, that would be a horrible name for a construction company um, that deals with machines. Well, I, I guess it just came from, I don't know, it's, it's just kind of like those things like we are not the part of the system to a certain degree, like we are rebels, we are outsiders, we're change makers. That, that, that's kind of where it came from a little bit inspired by the band Rage Against the Machine, um, which is basically speaking out against all of these, um, you know, speaking out against the system uh, in general. So that's what that name was inspired by. I, I imagine that it does, well, it definitely influences like the, the choices that you make as a producer and the films that you work yeah. on. And right now you are a member of the Academy for Motion Pictures, Arts and Sciences. Yeah um that's the documentary branch when you started filmmaking was this part of the plan was there a plan at all um you know what was the starting point wow i would love to think that i had this master <laughs> grand master plan no i did not um i just i think it's i mean it's it's amazing to i, I i'm a big believer in community um because before I was the vice chair of the Kenya Film and TV Professional Association, like over four years ago, um, where we are pu pushing for film policy change in Kenya and still are as an association, I'm no longer in within leadership. Um, I was also a member of the Kenya Oscar Selection Committee uh, for three years. So we were reviewing films that were submitted um, for consideration as Kenya's submission to the Oscars. Um, I also helped co-create um, a film, I don't want to call it a collective, but kind of like this um, group <laughs> of filmmakers where we fellowship together like once a month and we share our different experiences. So joining the Academy for me was joining a film, a global film community of people um, who believe in you know, film's ability to inspire, entertain, educate, um, you know, and just also just be, you know, like kind of like, <laughs> kind of like, um, you know, store, I guess, our collective global <laughs> um, uh, cultural heritage. I mean, because I think that that's what film and documentary is on so many different levels. So joining that, I mean, the process is, the process is outlined on their website. I was nominated by two members to join um, the academy. And the academy had like a real big um, push in terms of inclusion because people who look like me were not in the academy for very many years. Um, so I think uh, kudos to the academy just for being more inclusive, for also understanding that for a filmmaker like me from Kenya, um, producing one film alone <laughs> is such a huge achievement and kudos to everyone who's just even finished one film because we don't have access to public financing. Um, there's lots of barriers like us going and pitching, you know, just even traveling to IDFA where we met <laughs> or even just traveling to Hot Dogs where we pitched is just, it's almost impossible. So uh, kudos to the Academy just for also you know, been keen on pushing for diversity and inclusion. And yeah, so just grateful to be a member of the body and excited um, to see how I can contribute um, towards, you know, just somehow <laughs> uh, helping to use film to create change in the world. Yeah, that was going to be my, my next question to you. You know, like, how do you feel that, what it means for you as a filmmaker in Kenya? Because you spoke about a you know, it's a really small community of filmmakers and the work that um, uh, DocuBox is doing also. Uh, so, you know, how does, how did that make, how does that make you feel as a filmmaker in Kenya? You know, like when you receive the news and, you know, everything that you want to accomplish with We Are Not The Machine and elsewhere, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it made me, I was excited. I think it's an amazing opportunity I'm just waiting to see how it all goes. I'm just waiting to see how it all goes. Um, yeah, I think there's lots of work to be done. Um, and just in terms of creating a more inclusive space, um, just in terms of ensuring that more filmmakers like myself, like Soko, uh, generations behind us, like um, get conducive conditions to be able to develop, produce films and distribute them because distribution is still a huge challenge uh, for films from the global south. 
So, Lee, nee, thank you so much for being with me on Film and Impact. I'm really happy to have had this opportunity to speak with you. And I see, I do see great things for, you know, the work that you're doing, but also for filmmakers um, who can, you know, be nourished off your experience and the, the successes that you guys have had, as well as other filmmakers from, uh, from Kenya and the, you know, the African continent more largely. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Much. Thank you so much for having me and thank you for the incredible work that you're doing with your podcast and your yeah and just generally the work you do around impact. Um really honored to be part of your series and yeah, look forward to staying in touch.